This is the last segment, segment five of this discussion on distances, recursion, and invariance. And we are going to bring everything together in this lecture. But before that, we're going to see a few insights into new directions. So in segment one, we saw the elegant Levenstein algorithm. In uh, segment two, we saw what justifies it through invariant. In segment three, we saw another view of it through a recursive definition, which is very natural, but uh, and can be programmed directly in functional in a functional programming style. For example, in a functional programming language, even though we saw it can be programmed directly in uh, IFO. But uh, this implementation is very inefficient. We also saw that there was a close correspondence between the justification, the invariant of the iterative, the loop solution, and the recursive mathematical definition. But uh, what again exactly is this relationship? So now we are going to see it in a part four of the lecture. And this will, in particular, lead us to a different view of recursive computations and to the notion of dynamic programming. I'm going to illustrate some of the ideas on a different example. We could stay with Levenstein, but it's a non-trivial program. It's a fairly sophisticated program. So we're going to focus on the concepts using another example, a simpler example, uh, the famous Fibonacci algorithm. This is a, an algorithm that computes a sequence uh, devised by you know, this uh, gentleman uh, here. This is actually a uh, picture of a, a statue of Fibonacci that I took in uh, Pisa. And uh, this uh, Fibonacci, Leonardo Fibonacci was a great uh, mathematician of the 12th and 13th century. And he came up with this very interesting sequence, which uh, you find in various areas of mathematics. It seems that Indian mathematicians had in fact already encountered the sequence a few centuries before. So the way he presented it is uh, fairly amusing. I considered a number of um, pairs of rabbits which breed very quickly. So the rule of the game, if you like, is that each pair of rabbit is uh, uh, sterile for one month. And then uh, starting in the second month, they start producing a new pair of rabbits every month with the same rules. That is to say the new rabbits will, will become fertile after one month. So if we look at the values of the sequence, which is the number of pairs uh, starting in the first month, we have one pair. In the second month, we still have one pair because they're not breeding yet. In the third month, we have a second pair. So the Fibonacci uh, number in this case is uh, two. And since we have two pairs, the uh, second pair gets ready for breeding, but not right now. So at uh, month three, we still have just one fertile pair, so we have, which produces one uh, new pair. Rabbits uh, never die in this uh, version of the game. In month four, now we have two more pairs because the original pair still produces a new pair like every month, but the second pair is now able to uh, produce a second pair. Uh, at the next uh, stage, when the uh, third pair gets ready to breed, but not yet, we are going to have three more pairs since the original pair is uh, still producing a, um, um, a, a new pair. Same thing for the second pair and the uh, third pair. So now the sequence has value <coughs> eight for uh, index uh, six. So these are the su first successive values of the Fibonacci sequence. It's easy to see that it's given by this uh, formula. If for convenience, we start at zero, at month zero, we have zero pairs. At month one, we have one pair. So these are the two initialization values. And then at uh, months n for n greater than one, we still have all the pairs that we had in the previous month since rabbits never die. And we have one new pair for every fertile 
a pair that is to say for every pair that is at least two months old. So we have fib of n equal to fib of n minus one plus fib of n minus two. So if you want to compute the sequence, it's very easy. It's a standard pro problem, it's standard exercise in introductory introductory courses on programming, I'm sure you have done it. You can program it in an iterative way, which is very easy to do, or you can program it in a recursive way. Actually, the right way to go uh, between you and me is to uh, take an array, fill it with uh, as many values as uh, you will need, and then go from, from that array. Actually, we'll come back to this in a few moments. But let's assume that we take the program seriously and uh, program it in either, uh, we take the problem seriously and we program it in either an iterative or a recursive way. Let, well, let's actually assume that we program it in a recursive way in the functional programming style. So this is what's going to happen in the computation. So fib of five is defined as fib of four plus fib of three. We just apply the recursive uh, formula, so it's fib of four plus fib of three. Now let's compute fib of three. It's fib of two plus fib of one. Fib of one, that's one. Uh, this is one of the cases that is given directly by the formula. Fib of two if, uh, is fib of one plus fib of zero, and fib of one will really uh, so that it's one, and fib of zero is zero. So there remains to compute the left part of this uh, recursion tree, fib of four. So fib of four is fib of three plus fib of two. Uh, fib of two, okay, so uh, yeah, I, I hear you. Uh, I hear you say uh, deja vu, which maybe uh, is another form of saying recursion, right? We, we've seen this, but we are not uh, able to take advantage of this deja vu uh, here, first because it's French and second because uh, we, we are just applying the recursive formula. So we are recomputing something that we of course already saw in the right in the previous part of, uh, of the tree. So fib of two is fib of <coughs> one plus fib of zero. Fib of one is one and fib of zero is zero. And we have to compute fib of three, which again, we computed before, but we have to repeat the computation Fib of one is one, fib of two is fib of one plus fib of zero. I know I'm becoming like a broken record, <clears throat> but the broken record finishes at some point and this is it. So we have computed fib of five, which indeed is five, the sum of the value on this leaf line, one, uh, five times uh, one. So we compute the result, but of course it doesn't scale up because there is a combinatorial explosion of computations that repeat each other. The point is that by taking the recursion literally, by writing this recursive program, which decomposes again and again, we actually hit many of the same values repeatedly. And this is exactly what would happen if we took Levenstein in the recursive version that we saw at the, at the end of the previous segment and uh, computed the uh, successive iteration, the successive recursive calls of, of the function. Literally, we would uh, hit a, this kind of combinatorial exposure. So we are going to be interested in the kind of situations in which a recursive program indeed hits the same values again and again. And there is here a very interesting idea which uh, was invented by, was first published at least by a computer scientist, scientist called uh, uh, Donald Mitchie at the University of Edinburgh in the 1960s. So this is not uh, recent and he called it memorization. Not memorization, no R, but memorization. I keep getting um, uh, journal editors who when I use this technique and write memorization, <clears throat> add an R thinking that there's a typo, but no, there is no typo, it's memorization. And the idea is uh, straightforward. I think it follows uh, fairly naturally from the way I presented the problem, but of course, it's the uh, egg of uh, Christopher Columbus. Once you've seen it, it seems obvious, but it was not that obvious at the time. The idea is that if we perform a recursive computation and compute some values for some arguments, then as we go, we are going to store the values that we have computed, or at least some of the values in this case, we are going to store 
all of the values so that we can reuse them as opposed to recomputing them the next time we need them. So in the case of Fibonacci, here's the way it works. We're still going to use the recursive Fibonacci uh, formula. Fib of n equals Fib of n minus two plus Fib of n minus one. But when we use the formula to compute Fib of i for some value i, we don't blindly go into the recursion. We first find out if it has already been stored. Stored where? Where we are going to have a, an auxiliary data structure, which is in this case an array, which we call fib in uh, capital letters, starting at zero for, for convenience. And in this array fib, as you can guess, we are going to store the values of the Fibonacci function, which have already been computed. So when we use the formula, we first look up the array uh, fib, uh, big, big F, big, uh, big I, big B, to see if for that particular I, we already have a value. So if so, we're not going to go any further in the computation, we're just going to return the stored value. If not, that is to say the first time we ever encounter a, a certain argument to the function fib, we are going to compute it recursively. Of course, in this recursion, we are eventually, this can be proved in fact, in this case, going to hit some of the stored values, but just, at the highest level, we're just using the recursive function, the recursive formula to compute the function. And of course, we store it into this structure, which is what is called memoizing it. Okay? And the array itself is called a memo function. So the general idea of memoization of recursive functions is that we use a special auxiliary data structure called the memo function. It's called a memo function, but it's really a data structure, which is there to store values that have been encountered before, that have been computed before, so that we don't have to recompute it. So now, the, if we go back to Levenstein, the connection between the recursive version and the iterative version becomes completely clear, because in fact, the iterative version is, in a way, an iterative uh, computation of the recursive function, but it's a bottom-up computation. Bottom-up meaning that we start from the values that, that we have. And so what is the memo function in the Levenstein case? It is this uh, two-dimensional array, which I had called dist, which is used to record partial solutions to cases that we had already, that we have already encountered, like successive prefixes of the source string and the target string. So that's what it is. It's just a memo function. This general technique, which essentially uses a data structure to record intermediate values so as to compute a recursive function if efficiently through a space-time trade-off, this general technique is called dynamic programming. It was invented separately in the 1950s and 60s, independently of connection with recursion, but that's really what it is. Dynamic programming has many applications. There are a number of algorithms, in particular optimization algorithms that can be expressed in this way. Levenstein is a dynamic a programming algorithm, but here's a, but there are many other examples. For example, knapsack problems are being, being uh, packing. This is a general class of optimization problems that try to pack uh, stuff. So let's assume, for example, that you have been just selected as an astronaut on the next mission to the moon, and you have to decide what you're going to take with you. So the weight is very important. So you are giving only given only maybe one kilo of things to take. And so this is a difficult question. What are you going to take with you? Obviously, you need two novels by uh, Stan Hal. Uh, who would go to the moon, actually, anywhere else, uh, far from home, without two novels from Stan Hal? You need a, an MP4 player. You need a USB stick with all the leaders of Schubert to go into this MP4 uh, player. And, me, and, and a few auxiliary things, like a shirt, maybe a uh, toothbrush, so um, a Kindle, which might actually solve the uh, standout novel uh, problem. So uh, each, of the, each of those has a certain value 
uh, for you and you want to maximize the value while remaining within the one kilogram limit that you have been given. This kind of problem can be very naturally expressed as a recursive equation. And if you apply the recursive equation directly, you get into a combinatorial explosion like with Fibonacci or Levenstein. But if you compute it bottom up using dynamic programming, then you have extremely efficient algorithms. So time for some references. This is all going to be for this lecture and other lectures as well. All the references will be on the website. So you, you can go to uh, bertrandmeyer.com slash MOOC where you will find references for all the, the lectures. Uh, this one has the name Levenstein. So you have a number of concepts in my book, uh, Touch of Class. But, uh, the, the full name is Touch of Class, Learning to Program Well Using Objects and Contracts. It's an introductory programming textbook which uses some of these examples. Uh, you, uh, I'm not giving you the Amazon page because uh, Amazon uh, has different sites in different countries. You can just Google for the name and we'll find uh, the Amazon page. There's also the book's own page at attach.ethc.ch. The uh, paper that I mentioned about loop invariants is available from the ACM site, but you can also find it uh, here. Uh, and um, my code, the code that I showed at the beginning the iterative Levenstein code is uh, on a uh, GitHub repository that is going to be devoted to, to these lectures. By the way, this is a good code. I, I always write uh, carefully, but I'm not claiming that this is the best possible code in the world. It's, it's working code just to illustrate, to illustrate the concepts. For a dynamic programming, again, I'm not specifying any particular book because any good algorithms textbook will have a good description of dynamic programming. For example, the well-known textbook by uh, Cormin, um, uh, Rivest, and uh, others. On the notion of uh, bottom-up computation of recursive program, there's a very interesting, although certainly not recent, you know, uh, uh, 45 years old, 45 year old program, no, uh, article, sorry, by uh, Gérard Berry. Uh, again, you just uh, Google for the title, you'll find it in various, various places. Uh, on the web, it's a really brilliant paper which explains in very simple problems, uh, in, in very simple terms, uh, how to compute a recursive function uh, bottom up. And of course, you have the Eiffel.com site, which is about the Eiffel Studio product, and Eiffel.org, which is about the Eiffel approach with lots of documentation, white papers, and such. So, what have we seen? in these uh, four segments of the lecture. We've seen uh, an example of an algorithm, and of course, algorithm is the core notion in computer science. We've studied the Levenstein at a distance algorithm. It's very useful in practice. It is widely, widely used for uh, spell checking, for spelling correction, for spelling suggestions. It's also elegant and efficient. It's general characterization of these lectures that <clears throat> I only talk about things that, which I find elegant, uh, beautiful, the aesthetic aspect is very important, uh, as well as the practical aspect. <clears throat> There's a certain amount of magic in the first version of this uh, presentation, in the first uh, part of the presentation, which shows the algorithm. Why does it work? Well, to remove the magic, we use a loop invariant. Then we have a recursive version, and we have seen how recursion and iteration relate to each other. Uh, this has enabled us to gain, I hope, a deeper understanding of recursion. We considered it from a bottom-up perspective and we got an insight into a very interesting class of algorithms which are applications of recursion seen bottom-up, namely dynamic programming. I hope this detour through various aspects of computer science algorithmic uh, data structures and uh, algorithms has given you some understanding of important programming concepts. And I look forward to you participating in uh, the future lectures that are coming after this one in this series.